started. So thanks everyone for joining for our uh, noon talk today. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Avery Berman, who uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Physics at Carleton University and a scientist at the Institute of Mental Health Research at the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Center. Um, Dr. Berman did his master's at the MPU, so he's one of our own, and his PhD in biomedical engineering at, um, at McGill, uh, where he worked on quantitative imaging of brain physiology using MRI under the supervision of uh, Bruce Pike. Afterwards, he did his uh, postdoc studies at Harvard Med Medical School, working at the Martinus Center for Biomedical Imaging at Massachusetts General Hospital, the other MGH, uh, where he worked on pulse sequence development and modeling for high resolution functional MRI at uh, 7T. And today, uh, Avery is going to talk to us about imaging brain function with improved physiological and spatial specificity using MRI. So I just uh, read your title for you, Avery. <laughs> you get Perfect. Started. Yeah, perfect. Thanks so much for the introduction, John, and and thank you to you and Pete, Peter, as well, for the invitation to come present. It's really nice to be back amongst uh, kind of old colleagues that I haven't seen in a long time. Uh, so yeah, like like John said, I did my master's at McGill and then PhD as well. Although my supervisor moved, so I was kind of in Calgary for part of that time too. Um, so I've gotten to see a lot of the country and now the, in the U.S. and now happy to be back uh, close to Montreal and Ottawa. And so today I'll be discussing my PhD work and mostly postdoc work and a little bit of what we've gotten into since moving to Ottawa. Uh, yeah, so before I go into my own work, just wanted to give an overview of the medical physics uh, uh, environment here in Ottawa. So OMPI is the Ottawa Medical Physics Institute, and it's kind of like the, the home of our graduate program for both the master's and PhD. Um, and it's composed of like quite a broad you know, range of, of, uh, of researchers, uh, including we have six faculty members at Carleton. Um, and then, you know, that's kind of a small number of core faculty, but what, what I think really is our greatest strength is also the number of adjuncts that we have from uh, national research labs, including NRC, Health Canada, uh, Natural Resources Canada, and then, a, a, you know, a range of hospitals like the Ottawa Heart Institute, the Ottawa uh, the Ottawa Hospital and the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Center. So we have a lot of uh, members who are kind of like the, the core members uh, who are generally involved in research and then about 25 graduate students. So we have quite a range of, of research kind of uh, that we can undertake going from, you know, in the clinic at the cancer center or the diagnostic imaging uh, to metrology as well at NRC or, or um, uh, radiation protection, things like that at Health Canada or Natural Resources Canada. Uh, my own work, uh, so I've, I've drawn out a little map here for us to get situated. So we have Carleton down in the kind of the bottom of the screen. There's Parliament uh, just up in downtown. And then also uh, the research I do is located at the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Center, which is across this big field which believe it or not is an experimental farm in the center of the city uh, run by the Department of Agriculture uh, through the federal government. So yeah, we have a research dedicated 3T PET MRI scanner and that's where we get to do uh, our studies. And the goal of my research program is to make MRI more sensitive and specific to neuronal activity and brain physiology. And so we'll, we'll dive into that throughout this talk. Uh, but before I do, I also wanted to point out kind of the many different uses or users of functional MRI. So uh, by far and large, neuroscience and neuroscientists are kind of the, the largest uh, user group of fMRI. So they can do things like mapping out brain activity and what areas are more involved with things like sensory processing or, you know, more kind of fun things like musical improvisation or responses to stress, like you know, if I was giving this talk in person, how would I, my brain be lighting up? And it would be something like what's shown in this picture here. Uh, uh, but also beyond just neuroscience, it's also used clinically. So neurosurgery uh, is really a large, kind of the biggest clinical user of, of functional MRI. And you can use it to localize uh, uh, an epileptic focus if you're gonna do some uh, resection of a 
of a region that's kind of triggering uh, epileptic seizures. Uh, that's what's shown in the top image here. <clears throat> Also used, though, for mapping out uh, so-called eloquent cortex, which is generally kind of areas involved with uh, sensory motor um, uh, processes or language production and comprehension as well. So if a patient is going to have a tumor removed, you want to spare the eloquent cortex. <clears throat> we can also use fMRI for imaging brain physiology rather than brain activity per se, you know, which is maybe more associated with neuronal activity. Uh, but actually what's going on kind of with the brain physiology, like vascular health and things like that. So this is an example of severe cerebrovascular impairment where half of the brain responds to a stimulus, but the other doesn't because it has a major occlusion, arterial occlusion. Us as physicists are, you know, working to develop fMRI methods. So, you know, testing, say, the spatial specificity, like how, how spatially precise can we image brain activity and with what sort of confidence and and then also coming up with new contrast mechanisms that are sensitive to different aspects associated with brain activity. And then finally, I'm now associated with the uh, mental health center too, and psychiatry is actually a large push for the use of fMRI. And kind of the holy grail is to be able to identify individual patients or you know, and how uh, they may have, their disorder might be associated with underlying uh, network disorders across the brain. And so, yeah, I've kind of previously before joining Ottawa, I was specializing in kind of the physiology and physics of functional MRI and now slowly getting into kind of psychiatric applications. Oh, I already mentioned this. Uh, so here's the outline for my talk. So I'll give an, uh, an introduction to the physics and physiology of uh, the bold functional MRI signal and I'll introduce what bold is and then discuss some biophysical modeling that I've done for functional MRI with a technique called calibrated fMRI, and then go over what I did during my postdoc, which was developing uh, high resolution functional MRI, functional MRI methods at ultra high magnetic fields. And then uh, briefly kind of give a teaser of what I've been working on lately um, in my lab on kind of merging these two domains of uh, physiological imaging and high resolution imaging. So let's start with a bit of an overview. So I guess you, these the students here, if the, if the curriculum's still the same, you've just finished your MRI uh, component of your, uh, of your, at least the masters and, and new PhD students have just finished MRI and medical imaging. So you know that MRI is based on the nuclear magnetic resonance phenomenon. Uh, and so we're primarily sensitive to the magnetic moment of protons in water. So we're mostly imaging the molecular environment of water. <clears throat> Uh, we use a strong magnetic field aligned, you know, we call it B0, usually on the order of like 1.5 to 3 Tesla, um, and aligned along the direction of the scanner bore. We use a radio frequency system for both exciting and receiving signal from the water in our object that we're imaging or patient. And then we use gradient coils to spatially encode our image uh, or our object. And we we encode in K space, so the spatial frequency domain of our object. So this is what our data looks like coming off the scanner. And this is the K space representation of our image. And we just take the inverse Fourier transform and we can get back uh, a, a nice looking image of a brain in this case. And then our image contrast is determined by kind of two main uh, parameters or sets of parameters. So one of them is just the tissue itself. So where is the water in the first place? This is the proton density. And, and then we're also sensitive to its molecular environment. And this is reflected in the relaxation times, T1, T2, T2 star. And then we have some control over you know, how we can image these different um, tissue properties uh, through the pulse sequence itself. So changing flip angles, repetition times, echo times, et cetera. So you can see a range of these sort of image contrasts in the bottom from proton density weighted to T1 or T2 weighted or to T2 star weighted, which is really kind of the the main contrast mechanism we use in fMRI is T2 star imaging. So on that note, so what is the difference between T2 and T2 star? So in a typical kind of uh, ideal environment, our signal, our transverse signal decays away um, exponentially with a time constant T2. Uh, but our magnetic field isn't perfect. There, there's inhomogeneities in the magnetic field. So if these are spins, say, at the left of an imaging voxel and a spin out to the right of an imaging voxel, and they see some different uh, 
magnetic fields are going to process at different rates and dephase relative to each other, resulting in increased decay. So our T2, and we say that that's represented by a new relaxation time T2 star, so our signal's decaying away more rapidly. In terms of actually, you know, quantifying that, um, it's actually the inverse of T2 star, which we call, you know, say, R2 star, is given by the inverse of T2, plus some new contribution that's arising from these inhomogeneities in the magnetic field we call R2 prime. And R2 is irreversible, so we can't get rid of that decay. But R2 prime is reversible if we apply um, a 180 degree refocusing pulse. Um, if we apply that at some time, that's half of our echo time, we'll end up getting a spin echo at uh, our echo time in that case. Uh, and then just for completeness, if we don't apply the spin echo and we image, say, at the same echo time, we have a gradient echo image. So an area where this is relevant is in imaging blood oxygenation. And so uh, we're well aware that the brain requires a continuous supply of oxygen. Um, the brain doesn't actually have any of its own metabolic stores, so it needs to be divide, uh, delivered continuously to the neurons in the brain through the, the vascular supply. And the oxygen is transported bound to hemoglobin in red blood cells. And uh, really, you know, amazing property of hemoglobin is that when it's oxygenated, it's diamagnetic. So its magnetic susceptibility is slightly negative, uh, which is roughly what most tissues in the body are like. But when hemoglobin is deoxygenated, it becomes paramagnetic, so it has a positive magnetic susceptibility. And this is due to the iron within hemoglobin. So if we just take a cross section through, say, this fictional blood vessel up top, uh, and imagine in one case, it's nearly 100% oxygenated, like arterial blood. And in another case, it's only 60% oxygenated, uh, like venous blood. So on the top, the susceptibility of the blood is roughly matched with that of the surrounding tissue. On the bottom, the susceptibility of the blood is greater than that of the tissue. So when we place this, uh, you know, this vessel in a magnetic field, like anytime you put a person in, in, in a scanner, this results in there being spatially varying um, changes in the magnetic field due to this change in magnetic susceptibility. And so then that looks something like this. We'd have on the bottom, large field offsets or distortions around the venous blood vessels. And in contrast for the arteries, we'd have very little distortion of our magnetic fields. And so because we have larger amount of um, field inhomogeneity around veins, uh, this results in faster signal decay around veins. And we call this then the blood oxygenation level dependent or bold effect. So if we see how this uh, comes into play then um, to actually measure neuronal activity, I've got a, a, a little diagram here showing kind of like a toy vessel network where we have inflowing blood at the top and then it branches into a capillary bed in the middle and then flows out as venous blood at the bottom right. So cerebral blood flow supplies oxygenated blood to the capillary bed. And then the oxygen is actually extracted at the capillary bed and consumed. And the rate of consumption, we call the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption or CMRO2. And so as a result, we have slightly deoxygenated blood on the venous side. Uh, then deoxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic, as we've seen, so it perturbs the magnetic field. And so we have an intrinsically lower MRI signal uh, around the veins as compared to the arteries at the top. So during stimulation, though, what you know, several things occur. Neuronal activity increases, like if we're doing a task or something during the MRI, an MRI scan. So oxygen consumption increases as well to meet the increased energetic demands of the, of the neurons and tissue surrounding the vessels. But our blood flow actually has a much larger increase um, than the oxygen consumption. And we also get a large -ish increase in blood volume too, um, for all of this fresh blood flow to be accommodated by. And so this coupling then of neuronal activity and the vascular response we call neurovascular coupling. And I, I also want to emphasize here that this change in blood flow is far larger than that of the oxygen consumption change and also much larger than that of the blood volume change. So as a, as a result of this kind of overshoot in blood flow, 
um, change, this actually flushes out the amount of deoxyhemoglobin in the veins. So our veins become more oxygenated or more artery-like. So this decreases the amount of field inhomogeneities around the vessels, and we have a larger signal as a result. So our signal actually goes up with neur neuronal activity. And this is really the basis then of the bold fMRI um, signal. And so a typical experiment, how we do this, so a subject is put in an MRI scanner and we'll have them engage uh, in some sort of task, like you know, looking at a visual stimulus or something on a screen or doing some sort of motor task or cognitive task. And then we rapidly acquire a series of images on the order of every second or so. And then we can see, we can watch signal change uh, in a given brain region, say this is the visual cortex here. So we can watch the signal change uh, and correlate that with the task that we're having them do. Uh, and then derive some sort of activity map where there's uh, statistically significant changes in signal. Okay, so just to recap at this point, the, the bold MRI signal is sensitive to deoxyhemoglobin in blood. So we're primarily looking at signal changes coming from veins and capillaries. Um, and, and a lot of this comes from the fact that the energetic demands of neurons are dynamically met by the vasculature to supply nutrients. So we have this large change in blood flow uh, that results in an overshoot of oxygenated blood to tissue. So that results in an increased bold signal. And it's actually, it's pretty remarkable. If you go back to 1990, uh, the seminal paper from Seiji Ogawa, where he first discovered the bold effect in rodents by manipulating the oxygenation of the blood that they were, um, that they were breathing, he, he hypothesized, so he wasn't doing any functional MRI at this point. He was just looking at changes in, in T2 star-weighted signals. He hypothesized that the active region in a function, if you did a task now, could show darker lines in the image because of the increased level of deoxyhemoglobin resulting from higher oxygen consumption. So he was a physicist at Bell Lab. So he hypothesized that just oxygen consumption would go up and that the vessels would do nothing. They would just stay quiet this whole time. So he didn't realize though, as a physicist that Bell Labs kind of outside of the medical domain that there is actually this large kind of neurovascular coupling effect. Um, so he is searching for a couple of years for this like you know, the signal decrease and, and missed it. And in the meantime, uh, other labs that were more closely affiliated with hospitals actually caught up and were able to kind of at the same time publish as him the first uh, old fMRI experiments. It's kind of a cool bit of uh, history, but I also think it's important because it, it underlies kind of the importance of having collaborations in these interdisciplinary fields that we're in. So we're physicists and we're working with people with medical expertise and physiological expertise. You know, it's really important. So as a result, uh, today we have this great tool of bold fMRI and we can map brain activity non-invasively without the use of ionizing radiation and, and we don't need any contrast agents either. But it's still a really indirect measure of brain activity because it's this neurovascular coupling or it's really a vascular effect that we're imaging. So now we're gonna move on to some of the biophysical modeling work I've done to try and get more kind of physiologically specific measures of neuronal activity, not this kind of like huge mix of vascular and hemodynamic effects and, and metabolic effects. And so one way of, of trying to get more quantitative understanding of what's going on with the bold signal is through biophysical modeling or simulations. It can help aid our interpretation. So kind of like the simplest way of doing this is through simulations like Monte Carlo simulations. So you can develop some model of the vasculature and in the crudest form, you just model the blood vessels as infinite cylinders, as shown in this figure here. And we know then how cylinders distort the magnetic fields around them based on their susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility or their oxygenation. So here's just like a slice looking at the field distortions around these vessels. So you can see that you know, there's large distortions around certain vessels and not so large around others. So once we have this field map, we then need to model what's going on with the, the water molecules or the spins within the system. So we can model the diffusion, the random diffusion of these water molecules you know, around the blood vessels. Uh, and generally that diffusion process is kind of like a Gaussian, follows a Gaussian distribution. So, so a technique that I've worked on also is actually modeling diffusion by just smoothing our magnetized, like you know, some magnetization distribution with a Gaussian kernel. And that also effectively models diffusion over time. 
And so one uh, cool finding that came out in the early days of fMRI um, was showing how the bold contrast depends on the size of vessels that we're, uh, that we're imaging. So here, this is showing like a sagittal view through, uh, sorry, a coronal view through um, a brain slice. And it's showing kind of the, the vasculature feeding the brain. And then the top is an electron micrograph image showing you have these large peel vessels sitting on top of the cortex. The cortex is where all the gray matter is and where the kind of cell bodies and neuronal activity really takes place. And then you have uh, arteries that dive down, they branch into capillaries, and then blood is drained back to the surface through venules into these large peel veins. And so if we look then at how relaxation rates from, from uh, you know, a simulated voxel full of vessels of you know, a given size, and we change the size of that vessel, we look at how the relaxation rate changes. We find for a gradient echo or T2 star weighted experiment that uh, we have a small change in relaxation rate for small vessels, and then that uh, increases pretty rapidly and then plateaus for the larger vessels. And if we think of these relaxation rates as uh, kind of a, a measure of how sensitive we are to signal changes, this means that we're going to be more sensitive to signals from large vessels than from small vessels. So this would then correspond to these large vessels that sit on the surface of the brain, kind of far, relatively far still from the neurons that we're interested in. In contrast, if we do a spin echo fMRI experiment, we find that we get peak sensitivity to these kind of microvascular sizes. Um, and as a result, this corresponds roughly to the capillaries. And these are kind of in much more close communication than with the neurons themselves. So potentially spin echo fMRI is more uh, physiologically specific to uh, neuronal activity. And so these are just summarizing those two statements. So gradient echo bold gives us high sensitivity, which is great if you just want to detect any change, but it also has these large vessel biases. So we're kind of far away from the actual site of activity. Whereas spin echo is kind of the opposite. We have lower sensitivity overall because these relaxation rate curves are kind of small um, or small magnitude, uh, but we have this high capillary specificity, which we then say is, gives us higher neuronal specificity. So the same group that you know, performed these original studies took this a step further and tried to relate then the bold signal to kind of underlying physiological parameters of interest. So namely cerebral blood flow and the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. And they came up with this fairly simple model that relates then the bold signal that we measure to the phys underlying physiology. Um, and so why this is important is because the bold signal as it stands just tells us where activity is changing, but doesn't really give us, give us any quantitative information. So we can potentially start to understand how much different physiological parameters are changing with this, these sort of models. And, and this is important because if we just do a bold fMRI study on a, let's say a patient population, uh, we know that there's often significant impairment to the hemodynamic or the metabolic uh, kind of state of patients, say after a stroke or within a tumor. Uh, or neurodegenerative diseases. So if we try to interpret these bold fMRI experiments, uh, we really could easily be misled by the signals we, change, we, 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 we measure without further information. So uh, we can kind of turn this signal around and try to measure then the physiology, as, as I was mentioning in one of the opening slides, we can try to measure brain physiology uh, using the bold signal. And this is now kind of its own domain of fMRI research called physiological fMRI. So specifically, one of the key targets is measuring oxygen metabolism uh, using this so-called Davis model, which is just this expression shown here, because oxygen metabolism is, is it's really one of the kind of like best measures we have of neuronal energetics or for neuronal signaling, as well as kind of just tissue viability in the area. So it's more physiologically specific than the bold signal. It's quantifiable, so it means it's interpretable for us. And it's also an important contribution to the bold signal. So we wanna be able to measure it uh, more directly. So things that we can measure uh, include the bold signal, and we can also measure blood flow using techniques like arterial spin labeling, which I'm not gonna get into. So we can get these, these constants, alpha and beta from the literature, or we can try to model them at least. So now kind of the key in this, in, in this if we wanna be able to measure CMR2 is, trying to uh, get at what this M value is. 
And it turns out it, it relates to the maximum possible bold signal we, can, we could measure from any given voxel. And this happens if we flush out all the deoxyhemoglobin. So our vessels just become arteries, essentially. Then we're going to have no bold signal left at that point. Uh, so this is going to be regionally varying because it relies on the blood volume in a given voxel and the blood oxygenation in a given voxel. So this means we can't just use a constant from the literature for this. Uh, so we actually have to do subject-specific calibration measurements. And so this is the field of calibrated fMRI or a technique that's called that. And the whole goal of calibrated fMRI is to measure M. And so there's a few different ways to do that now. Um, most of them use gas challenges where you have a subject lie in the MRI scanner and they're breathing on a gas circuit. Typically it's room air that they're breathing, uh, but then you can deliver you know, a little bit of extra carbon dioxide in, their, in the air that they're breathing, say like 5% carbon dioxide and the rest would be room air. And this is carbon dioxide, it's a potent vasodilator. So it's gonna change blood flow as we see in this expression here. Uh, but hold metabolism constant. So we can solve for our, we can measure bold, we can measure the change in blood flow, and then we can solve for M this way. Um, some people feel uncomfortable with hypercapnia. Um, you kind of feel like you're, you're not getting enough air. So another uh, technique we can use is using hyperoxia. So subjects breathe in just more oxygen and you don't even really notice it at that point. Um, but it requires a few more assumptions in our modeling. But either way, just the whole process of getting a person on the scanner and putting the mask on, uh, it's quite uh, tedious and subjects can, may feel claustrophobic already getting in the MRI scanner. Um, so the goal of, throughout my PhD work was actually to try to remove the gas challenge entirely. Um, what are we doing here? Yeah, so this is just listing some of the, the challenges or confounds potentially of, of these gas challenges and motivating why we'd want to do gas free. And so the main idea of doing gas-free imaging is that um, we can relate this M value that we want to measure to the underlying R2 prime um, relaxation term, which I mentioned in the introduction. So it's the reversible component of transverse decay. So if we can measure R2 prime, potentially we can measure this M value without having to do any gas challenges. Uh, so the way that I went about measuring R2 prime was with a, a pulse sequence called an asymmetric spin echo sequence, where it's just like a spin echo where you have, say, your initial uh, decay, signal decay, you apply a 180 pulse, you measure your signal at the spin echo, and then you repeat this experiment, but you shift the timing of your 180 degree pulse, but still keep your echo time where you actually read out the same. So if you shift that pulse earlier in time, you get a spin echo occurring earlier, but you measure the decay um, later on. So your signal will be lower with an asymmetric spin echo. And the amount we, that the echo is shifted relative to the time we read out, we call that tau or the asymmetric spin echo shift. So then we can get at R2 prime by just looking at the ratio of our signals here. Um, and this was actually proposed at the beginning of my PhD by another lab. And they found that this tended to underestimate the M value when they compared it to a measurement with hypercapnia, which is kind of like the gold standard where you have people breathe in more CO2. And so it was proposed that um, reasons for this underestimation is that we actually have diffusion in our extravascular space, which means that we don't get perfect spin echo refocusing. Um, so we're still underestimating then this R2 prime value. So then my, my aim then was to characterize and correct for that underestimation, doing both an experimental in vivo study on, on volunteers, but guided a lot by simulations to try to give us more insights into why we're underestimating uh, the M value. Uh, so uh, one of the keys to this was that the asymmetric spin echo signal model assumed that this ratio of a spin echo over an asymmetric spin echo signal was constant. Uh, but in fact, what I found through the simulations was if we changed our echo time, where we're measuring this, this ratio of spin echo over asymmetric spin echo signals, these curves are not constant at all. And in fact, they decay away with time. And this would then explain why we underestimate uh, the RM value in this way. So this is kind of like our canonical uh, model of the asymmetric spin echo signal, if you like. And if you take the ratio of it with the spin echo, we get what we had before, this R2 prime times tau. So then to try to capture this decay 
in, in this uh, ratio of signals, I added, uh, I introduced this new quadratic decay term, which I called R2 diffusion. So some sort of diffusion induced decay of our spin echo signal. And when I introduce that, then there's now this kind of linear decay term in the ratio, which is somewhat reflective then of the nearly linear decay that we see in these curves here. So I called that the quadratic asymmetric spin echo model. And so if we can fit, if we can measure our spin echo and asymmetric spin echo signals at multiple echo times, then we can fit for this R2 diffusion term and then get a, a more accurate estimate of R2 prime and our, our M value in turn. So these are the simulation side of things. So then went and tested this in vivo. So um, the, the gas recalibration experiment that I performed was using a, uh, an asymmetric spin echo sequence um, where we acquired a, spin, a true spin echo image where the tau is zero. So there's no shift in our refocusing pulse and one with an asymmetric spin echo shift of 30 milliseconds. And then acquired these sets of images at four different echo times, so ranging from 42 milliseconds up to 70 milliseconds, and then compared what happens if we estimate M using just a single echo time, like the previous study had done, versus if we fit for the decay of um, this, like this R2 diffusion term over the echo times. And then as an additional comparison, I also performed this hypercapnic calibration with a gas challenge, which con consisted of acquiring data continuously while subjects inhaled uh, air for two minutes and then a little bit of 5% carbon dioxide for two minutes and then air again for two minutes and acquired data that would give us both the bold signal change and the uh, cerebral blood flow change as shown here. So this is a single repetition time of a blood flow weighted signal. And then here's the average over our entire time series for blood flow. So it looks like a much nicer blood flow map. And then here's like a bold weighted uh, image. Uh, so then looking at the results, uh, this was averaged across seven participants in the end. Um, uh, this is showing our M values in several different ROIs. So uh, frontal regions shown in yellow in this kind of example slice, uh, occipital, which is in pink on the right, parietal green, which is kind of more in the middle, and same with temporal in blue, and then all gray matter as well. Um, so generally what we find is that we're still underestimating our M values relative to hypercapnia in each ROI, uh, but the underestimation is kind of improved, I guess you could say, uh, when we use this quadratic signal model. And there's, there's still a lot of variability, unfortunately, in these results, uh, but it's still kind of in line with what we saw with the simulation. So it's really promising uh, that we can correct for this underestimation to some extent, but we might be missing some other effects uh, besides just uh, diffusion. So to summarize here, um, you know, we really want to measure oxygen consumption. It's one of the best markers of neuronal activity that we can measure with fMRI or with MRI. And we can do that with calibrated fMRI. Uh, so we proposed this new strategy for gas-free calibration that combined, you know, simulations, analytical modeling, and experimental imaging. So we had a whole kind of suite of tools to try to approach this problem. Um, and they kind of feed into each other. The results from one modality feed into another. Um, so we can improve the accuracy for kind of intermediate to large vessels, but maybe not the smallest vessels. Uh, and, and this is, you know, these methods in general are important for making more quantitative techniques, uh, more accurate, practical, and available at other clinics that don't want to use gases necessarily. Uh, just gonna, what time, 12.35? I'm gonna skip the next two slides, which are just touching on a little bit kind of where we're going with this um, and just move away from calibrated fMRI and, and discuss some high resolution fMRI methods. <clears throat> so yeah, I moved, shifted, really shifted gears quite a bit, still stayed within the fMRI realm, but moved from this physiological imaging to kind of more classic fMRI, just bold imaging, but, um, developing new methods to perform bold imaging at really high spatial resolutions. And this is made possible by using higher magnetic field strengths, which uh, give us higher SNR so we can make voxel sizes smaller. So in general, why would we want to push the spatial resolution of fMRI? So for decades, we were, we were pretty happy imaging at you know, roughly two to three millimeters 
uh, in voxel size, like what's shown on the left, isotropic. And this could give us kind of like the large scale or macroscopic organization of, of brain areas involved with certain tasks. Um, uh, sorry, just got a weird pop-up. Yeah. Um, but there's really actually quite a few structures within the brain that are organized at spatial scales smaller than these millimeter or multi, uh, several millimeter uh, uh, sizes, such as the layers across the cortex, so layers across gray matter, which have different functional roles like uh, receiving input or providing feedback to other layers. Uh, there's also functional columns, which maybe are receiving like in the visual cortex input from the left versus the right eye. Um, these are both structured at well below a millimeter in spatial scale. Similarly, like nuclei of the central nervous system also can range in size from less than a millimeter to a few millimeters. So we'd also want high resolution uh, acquisitions if we wanted to measure changes with these uh, with functional activity. And so also beyond the kind of the main anatomical uh, and physiological justifications for wanting higher resolution, even just the, the effect on analysis and interpretation of our results is pretty huge. So uh, on the right, I've, I've shown a point, a, a bold image, a bold image that I acquired at 0.8 millimeters isotropic voxel size. And then I downsampled it by a factor of three on all three dimensions to generate like a more conventional fMRI image. So you can see that it's obviously much uh, less well resolved. But importantly, if we zoom in on, on one area here, you can see massive changes in the kind of the anatomy that we can observe. In particular, the veins uh, that we see in the high resolution image that we don't see at all in the low resolution image. And knowing what we know now that you know, our fMRI signal really comes from deoxygenated blood. Uh, if we're gonna see large bold signals kind of around these veins, uh, being able to see them gives us a much better opportunity to interpret the signal. Like it's not really coming from the tissue at this point, the signal is coming from those big veins, but we, would, we wouldn't be able to see those big veins. We would just assume it's coming from the tissue in general. So uh, just moving to higher resolution allows us to better interpret uh, the activity that we'd be seeing. But there's some significant challenges with moving to higher spatial resolution. So recall we're acquiring all of our data in case space. So uh, like a, an image here on the right. And the typical acquisition that we use is called echo planar imaging or EPI, where we acquire a single slice of, through, our, through our subject uh, in a single shot, um, um, like one TR. And so this readout will zigzag throughout case space really rapidly on the order of say 30 milliseconds. And then we get all of the data for that slice, as opposed to conventional 2D imaging where you acquire each line in a separate TR. So it's a really rapid way of acquiring data. So if we wanted to double our, our in-plane spatial resolution, for instance, we'd have to cover four times more case space. This means that our readouts are gonna get longer. Um, and a result of having long readout duration, uh, durations is that we actually introduce more geometric distortion along, especially along this kind of this vertical or KY direction. And we, so we have more distortion, we also have more spatial blurring, and it also pushes out kind of our, our optimal echo time. So we have a reduced contrast to noise ratio potentially. So ways of kind of pulling this back and reducing the readout duration include uh, accelerated parallel imaging, but still going to these sub-millimeter resolutions um, requires high undersampling factors. So uh, in parallel imaging, we just don't acquire every line of case space. And we use a receiver coil array, so it has multiple coils, and we can use kind of individual coil elements themselves to help uh, fill in that missing data. Uh, but, but yeah, to get to the high resolutions that we want, uh, we're just introducing too many undesired artifacts at the, the undersampling factors we need. So another question is, can we just scan faster? Can we zip through case space even more quickly? And the answer is actually, yes, we can. We can crank up our gradients and the gradient slew rate, which is the rate at which the gradients change. Uh, but we're intrinsically limited by us <laughs> as humans. Uh, when we see these rapidly changing magnetic fields, that induces what's called peripheral nerve stimulation, 
uh, where you will actually get muscle twitching, especially related to the large nerves that feed kind of like large muscles. So like your back, you might get spasms in your back, shoulders, things like this. So this is a serious concern then for patient comfort and safety. So we can't actually scan just more quickly as a result of us. So we say then today uh, that we're encoding limited. We just can't traverse case space fast enough to go to these high resolutions that we want. <clears throat> so some of the workarounds include acquiring our data in multiple shots. So it's kind of like a hybrid between acquiring all of our data in one shot versus all of our, you know, each line in a single shot. We can kind of break it down. So we could acquire data in two shots if we like. And that's what this little GIF on the right is showing here. We acquire half of the case space where the lines are interleaved uh, in one shot and then the other half in the next shot. But the order in which we loop over segments versus all of the slices makes actually a, has a pretty big impact on uh, the quality of the images that we get. So I'll just break that down a bit more. Um, here, this is showing a, a toy example. If we have three slices we want to, want to acquire data from in two segments, the conventional way we would, we would acquire the data is to get all of slice one, segment one, then slice two, segment one, then slice three, segment one, and so on, and then loop back around to get segment two for all the slices. And so typically there could be a long delay between acquiring these segments for a given slice, like slice one could, we might have to wait one to two seconds before we get its, the rest of its case-based data. So this leaves us vulnerable then to subject motion or respiration, which can, the respiration, even if our subject doesn't move at all, can change the magnetic field locally. Um, so this results in what we call intermittent ghosting artifacts. So it looks something like this, like here's a ghost where we have our main image and then we have an undesired ghost, which is overlapping uh, the brain in this case. <clears throat> so this then degrades the temporal stability of our fMRI data which then uh, makes it more challenging to measure functional changes that we're looking for. So the other way of looping is to acquire all of the segments first for a given slice as shown here. So slice one, uh, segment A and B of slice two now, then A, then B of slice three and so on. So there's not much time for any motion to be an issue between acquiring each segment for a given slice. So this is a, a technique called fleet or fast low angle excitation echoplanar technique. And so it reduces our risk of getting this intermittent ghosting artifact. Uh, but if we wanna get really high SNR, uh, like, we want, like we need for being sensitive to small bold signal changes, we actually have to change our flip angle across all of our segments. So it's kind of from an engineering and physics side, it's a bit more of a complicated sequence too. Uh, but we were up for the challenge. And so uh, here's an example of kind of like a, a the RF pulses that we would use if we were to take the vendor's RF pulses and the slice profile we get across, say, the, the Z direction through, um, through uh, a single slice in a, in a participant. So we're changing the flip angle here. So we're starting with a 35 degree pulse, which is essentially a, a sync pulse. Uh, we apply it and we get some pretty decent looking slice profile. Uh, we apply our next scaled version of this RF pulse. And we get a similar looking slice profile, but now we have some broadening of the slice profile. We receive, we get the, the, the right flip angle right at the center of the slice. <clears throat> and then finally, to really maximize our SNR, we use a 90 degree flip angle. And after we apply it, we get a really broadened um, and distorted slice profile. So we have these inconsistencies in our signal intensity and those are gonna be interleaved in case space. Uh, so that's gonna result in what we call stable ghosting as opposed to intermittent ghosting in the last acquisition. So we came up with a recursive RF pulse design so that we could try to achieve the same slice profile across all three shots. So here's say our first RF pulse at 35 degrees flip angle, and we get you know, a, a, a slice profile. We then now have a recursively designed 45 degree pulse, gives us the same slice profile like as we desired, and then our 90 degree pulse, which again gives us the same slice profile. And so you can see that these definitely aren't just scaled versions of each other. Each pulse um, is, is kind of unique from the other. And so when we see it, how this plays out in the actual imaging experiment, I'm gonna show a video uh, acquired at 70 
uh, with just one just one by one by one millimeter cubed or isotropic uh, imaging. And this is two shot imaging. And so here's our conventional acquisition. And hopefully you can see and appreciate some of the, the flickering and in signal intensity. And it's really quite structured as well. It kind of gives an outline of the brain in some points. Um, when we then do kind of this fleet acquisition with the variable flip angle, but use the vendor's pulses and just scale them, we have significantly less uh, uh, flickering in our image intensity, but we see kind of more just non-uniformity through the image. And this is because each shot now has a slightly scaled intensity because of the changing slice profile. So then when we do finally the BFA fleet method with our recursive pulse design, we eliminate both the intermittent flickering as well as that kind of just uh, static, in, uh, static inhomogeneity of the signal. And so just at the bottom, I show what is the segment TR. So this is the time between acquiring these two shots of data for a given slice. And so you can see that it's about two seconds in the conventional segmented approach. And that's why we see a lot of this flickering, whereas it's 63 milliseconds uh, for these VFA fleet methods. So we've reduced this, the flickering despite there being motion, which I think you can see in this sagittal view here. Um, yeah. So to quantify this, we can look at what we call the temporal SNR or the TSNR. So this is just the uh, mean signal divided by the standard deviation over time. And you can see in the conventional segmented approach and the VFA fleet with the scaled pulses, a lot of kind of non-uniformity in our images in these TSNR maps. And what this non-uniformity means is that, uh, you know, if our activation is going to overlap in these areas, we're going to see different, you know, kind of activation strengths. And so we're not going to, if there's missing inter if there's missing activation in an area, we're, we're not going to be able to interpret whether or not that's because it was just an artifact or because for some reason there was no activation in that area. So we were really pleased with these uh, preliminary results. So then we wanted to kind of uh, push the limits a little bit more and do a functional activation task. Uh, so we um, had subjects view a flickering checkerboard. So it's a very simple stimulus, just a visual stimulus. And in this case, we acquired data at 0.6 millimeters isotropic. We achieved that by using three shots. Uh, and on top of that, an undersampling factor of four. So each shot of the three was undersampled by a factor of 12. So it's really reducing the amount of time we have to read out. And so here's activation maps in three different subjects and at like three very different uh, kind of slice prescriptions. So um, the acquisition works well, kind of independent of, of how we orient the slices. <clears throat> and we see really robust activation, especially in this one subject, and then kind of more of what we'd expect uh, in, in these other subjects too. Um, also want to point out that the, so the overlay is the statistical activation map. But the underlay is the bold fMRI data itself. It's not like a separately acquired anatomical image. So this is just kind of, for people used to looking at bold images, this is a mind blowing amount of anatomical detail that we see in the raw bold images. This is averaged over one run, not a single repetition, but still a lot of anatomical detail. So ultimately we still wanna to get to, to applying these techniques then to measuring kind of more, uh, laminar structure uh, throughout the cortex, but I haven't quite got there. The pandemic also got in the way a lot. Uh, so some take home messages, you know, by, by using ultra high uh, magnetic field, we can go to ultra high field. Uh, we can go to ultra high spatial resolutions rather. So down to 0.6 millimeter isotropic is what we, we were able to publish here using 7T imaging. We were able to reduce a lot of in, image artifacts by combining different strategies with like these short readouts. Um, and uh, you know, a recursive RF pulse design and acquiring slices, uh, segments of a slice one after the other. But this does have a trade-off that it increases the amount of time it takes to acquire our volume. So I've also implemented a, what we call a simultaneous multi-slice uh, version of this where we can acquire multiple slices in a single you know, excitation effectively. Uh, there, therefore kind of increasing the field of view we can image by a factor of two or three or more, or reducing the time it takes to acquire the data by two or three or more. Also looked at other applications of this. Um, 
So spin echo versions as well, like I'd mentioned, spin echo should have more capillary or neuronal specificity, but that was really uh, hampered by the pandemic, I'll admit, uh, but we're trying to finish that work now with the postdoc at Martino Center. Um, we also use this not for necessarily super high resolution imaging, but to reduce our echo time in our fMRI data, uh, doing this with a technique where we actually inject a, a contrast agent called ferromoxetol that will circulate over several hours in a patient. And so now we're gonna be able to image uh, changes in T2 star related signal, uh, but that's more directly related to blood volume. So we can actually see when blood volume goes up, our signal goes down. And that's what we see uh, here in this kind of trial response. And we needed to have a shorter echo time because the, the iron in ferromoxetol really re reduces our T2 star. And then also we've also done, we've applied this, the same sort of uh, multi-shot sequences to anatomical imaging to do distortion free and motion insensitive diffusion weighted imaging. Um, so we call that the voodoo technique. Um, and ideally we want to apply this in maybe pediatric populations where motion is a bigger issue and also body imaging. <clears throat> so it's a really versatile sequence. Uh, we can, we can image a, a large range of contrast types like T2 star, T2, T1, diffusion, blood flow. Um, so it's not just like a one trick pony, uh, this type of acquisition. So I did want to quickly go over sort of what I'm doing now. Um, I'll just be very brief about it. Uh, I'm interested in kind of marrying these two techniques, high resolution imaging, physiological imaging, a target uh, for this that's really um, important to us is cerebral small vessel disease imaging. So really small vessels as we get older, especially uh, become susceptible to injury. And so even 20% of the uh, older population by the age of 70 are showing radiological signs of, of cerebral small vessel disease. Uh, but a key is that so there's all these different ways of kind of identifying it. So white matter hyperintensity, lacunes, and large perivascular spaces, and so on. But all of these are quite downstream from the actual vessels that we're interested in and are late effects where the vessel or the damage has already taken place. So what we want to know is how can we actually directly image the health of these of the small vessels themselves directly instead of these indirect effects, which 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 are then later seen on the surrounding tissue. So we want to develop, uh, we're looking into these methods called single vessel imaging, where it's really high spatial resolution imaging of the vasculature itself. And you can use something like phase contrast imaging to measure blood velocity in small vessels. We're taking a slightly different approach using time of flight imaging. And I, I won't go through the details of that. We're developing a phantom together with uh, an undergraduate student who's really good at uh, CAD design and 3D printing. So we have a phantom with really small kind of like models of flow, like these very thin tubes. And we can pump very slow rates of, of water flow through these as well, and then try to test how accurately we can measure the known velocities of flow through these phantoms. Yeah, so, so that's it, let me conclude. Um, hopefully I've shown you that bold fMRI is really you know, a great tool. We, you know, some of us think it's the best tool for non-invasive human brain mapping. Um, but we have to always keep in mind that the underlying physiology and vasculature contribute really enormously. Uh, we're really measuring a vascular signal and the neuro neuronal activity can be quite far upstream from what we're measuring. So we have to you know, interpret our, our, our results kind of with that in mind. <clears throat> but we can gain more physiological and anatomical specificity using techniques like calibrated fMRI where we get quantitative measures of physiological parameters, which might have more clinical appeal when you actually want to measure how something is changing with a certain treatment or over time. But it's lacking widespread adoption, especially because we need these gases. Um, so yeah, hopefully these gas recalibration methods can really uh, help take that to another level uh, clinically. And then we can also gain more anatomical specificity using high resolution imaging. So this is important for just interpreting our fMRI results, but also imaging you know, structures that you know, our current voxel sizes just won't allow us to do. And, and, and we were using the segmented EPI approach called variable flip angle fleet. And a lot of other groups are now moving in this domain for ultra high field imaging. So it's really like a segmented EPI renaissance. So yeah, I'd like to um, 
thank our funding sources for their support, uh, collaborators, lab members, past mentors, and especially you for your time and for the invitation. So happy to take any questions. <laughs>